How are we doing? Good. Some of you are good. That's good to hear. Good things are good. When I, uh, uh, very, uh, very often, I think I've said this here before, but very often when I pick up a guitar, I'm just singing to myself and worshiping a lot of songs, two songs that come up a lot is Be That My Vision, but also uh, Rich Mullins and Beaker writing Sometimes by Step, and then the chorus of that was singing that song, Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Um, I will seek you in the morning, I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you lead me. I think that's such a helpful thought. This isn't in my notes or anything. This is just, this is for free for the moment. I think, you know, so often I hear people talk about counting their steps and, you know, I got, how, what's the thing? People need, what, 10,000 steps a day? I don't know. I don't keep track of steps. But people say, I've got to hit this step goal, that step goal. We have an acknowledgement that we need a lot of steps in the day. We take a lot of steps in the day. And that song is a simple reminder that step by step, you lead me. Every step, in my parenting steps, in my job steps, in my family steps, in my selfish steps, in my ignorant steps, in my apathetic steps, may those things be surrendered to God and may he lead us. And we're going to talk about that today. That, uh, that connects to um, this overall posture. Uh, listen, we're going through the book of Judges. And, you know, we crawled through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and the book of Judges, we, we were going to kind of blitz through. We were uh, doing our Fall Fellowship series, and there'll be some J.D. Greer videos. I, I encourage you, urge you, push you, jump into a life group. Because the whole point of life group is to do things together in small groups that we can't do in this large room together in an hour. We don't have time for it. Uh, and so that's the whole idea is that we could share life together in life groups. And in those life groups, we're going to be watching videos, particularly about all the stories in Judges. And you know, sometimes we, we watch those videos in here during the Fall Fellowship Series. We're not doing that this year. We're just watching them in the live groups. You can also watch them from home. If you don't have a Right Now Media account, our church gifts that to you. We can give you access to that. It's a whole bunch of devotional videos online that cover all sorts of stuff in discipleship, parenting, finances, uh, gosh, all, uh, work as worship, all sorts of things. And then these judges videos are going to be there. The reason I mention that yeah, so heavily this morning is we, I planned on talking about uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Iglon, and Shadar, and, and kind of covering these big intense stories this morning. And as of Saturday, when I was kind of preparing, there is just one verse I can't get past. And so instead of talking, you know, about maybe 20 or something verses and going through several stories this morning and hearing about a fat guy getting stabbed and him defecating himself. And there's a really intense story in the Bible that you probably don't even believe is in there. You should read it, the story of Ehud. It'll change your life. Instead of talking about all that, we're probably mostly going to talk about one verse today because I feel very led to, uh, to talk about that. Uh, but in general, we have the judges cycle. I want to kind of walk you into that. If you missed it, the judges cycle looks like this. Um, it's nope. Uh, it's the uh, strike two. There it is. Nailed it. Look at that, that guy. So um, uh, you notice the difference in quality of graphics there. Calm down. Calm down. We'll get back to that. So uh, this is the story of Judges over and over and over. So the people sin. They forget God. They move into some sort of oppression. The Israelites do. Then they have some sort of repentance. And then God raises up a judge. When you think of judge, you think of like someone in a black gown that has a gavel and pow. This is different. This is more like a judge, a tribal leader, right? And we can import all these ideas of what we think judges are. But in general, this is a leader, a deliverer that God raises up to, uh, to deliver them, to save them, right? And so this deliverer comes, this judge, and then there's a time of peace, and that ultimately leads back to sin uh, because of laziness and not wanting to follow God and selfishness. And you see this spiral getting worse and worse. We'll see in the book of Judges that every judge gets more and more corrupt and is more and more of a schmuck. And every judge is a worse person. Israel gets further and further, and the stories get more extreme. And it's, it's just a dark book. And the whole idea is that we have corrupt hearts. And this brought us to this quote that we read several times last week by Tara Lee Cobble. It says, the problem is the human heart. It doesn't respond well to laws. It responds to what it loves. And when we went through the Sermon on the Mount. We talked a ton about how uh, so much of this is a problem with our heart. We need a heart change. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, I encourage you to grab a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a black one that looks like this on the seats in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, that's our gift to you. Take this home. Read the book of Judges. Uh, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Like, think about what is God asking me? What does God want me to do? Jesus tells us. 
read about it. Uh, this is what we've got. And so we want to be about the Word of God this morning. Let's pray uh, and, and continue our focus to have ears to hear what God wants to say. Father, thank you that you've brought us here together. We take this moment to breathe and to think of your spirit, your power. Tell us that, that your breath is in us if we believe in you and, and that you're transforming us. And we pray in the power of your spirit that you would uh, give us ears to hear, that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds, that we would be submitted to you, and that your spirit would guide us into remembering you to teach us all things. I pray for those who don't know you. Pray for those who, who feel broken, disconnected, uh, don't have healthy church relationships. God, we, we want to grow in you as one body. May we see your kingdom come and your will be done as we read your word. Amen. We're going to start in uh, Judges chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, this is the verse we're going to camp out on for quite a while. Uh, this is kind of a theme for Judges. Later on, you see this verse kind of repeated without the second part because it's just an acknowledgement that this is what evil in the sight of the Lord is. Judges uh, chapter 3, verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. You will see that verse over and over and over in Judges. It's kind of like an intro to, hey, here you go. Bad things are happening. Things need to get better. Uh, they haven't followed the Lord. Here in verse 7, right, you know, as we kind of had the intro to Judge last week, this actually unpacks what that is. What is evil on the side of the Lord? They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth uh, as a fertility god, uh, as kind of a multiple eclectic group of idols and, and lesser god things. Uh, but they forgot God, and they served idols. Israel did what was evil on the side of the Lord. And the way that Judges wants us to understand that and the way we're going to see what is evil inside of the Lord, it's forgetting God and worshiping idols. So the issues. Uh, how many people here would say they're forgetful people? I'm just a forgetful person. Some, who here never forgets anything? You're just that elephant, man. You just... <laughs> Oh, man, I just saw, like, some spouses, like, in cut, like, someone's like, I never forget anything, and the spouse is like, mm, you're lying. How many people are liars? So, um, forgetting is an interesting concept, because we're, we're about to talk about forgetting the Lord. We're going to talk a lot about forgetting and remembering. In the Bible, it's a very spiritual, significant thing. I made a list of forgetting stuff, um, and I'm just going to kind of go through this for you, uh, because I think forgetting has levels of depth, Right? Uh, if I go to lunch with someone and I say, hey, man, I forgot cash and this place only takes cash. Then it's like, that's okay. That's forgivable, right? Because I'm a millennial. Who carries cash? Back off, Dave Ramsey people. It's ridiculous, right? Like, come on. I don't need a wad of $1,100 in grocery money in my pocket all the time. I ain't got time for that. We have plastic. Thank you. Video games, it's all electronic. Come on. So anyway, so we went to, we went to uh, the football game Friday night. And I thought for sure in the 21st century, they would take cards. Guess what they don't take? Cards. Thank, thank the Lord for some generous man. If you're watching, dude who paid for us, some dude just walked up and started throwing hundies at the person and paid for my family to get in the football game. Great. Thank God we got in. None of our kids got to eat because Papa didn't bring no cash. And so, but it's it's innocent, right? I forgot cash. That happened. Uh, I, I tried to be vague about this for those of you who who hold fast this. But have you ever had that parenting moment where you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, the tooth fairy visits at night. Whoops. You know what I'm talking about. You have that experience, you're like, oh gosh, my kid's going to discover not that. So you got to fabricate something. Maybe none of you lie to your kids. That's fine. Um, oh gosh, what did I just do? <laughs> Whoa, calm down. <laughs> So then, right, so it's an innocent thing. Uh, uh, you forget to uh, load or unload the dishwasher as a kid. Man, my dad and I, oof, constant arguments. Like, why didn't you unload the dishwasher? I forgot. You unload it every day, Davey. Why didn't you unload it? I just forgot, Dad. You didn't forget. You just didn't care. No, Dad, I forgot, right? You guys are familiar with the story. Uh, my first car, I had a 1986 Lincoln Town car. Turns out, cars need oil changes. <laughs> I forgot. Never knew that, so blew up that car. Um, I forgot to strap down the mowers on trailers. Uh, my grandpa and I would go mow yards, and then I'd just, you know, I'd forget. And my grandpa, man, he would say this phrase. He'd say, Dave, you didn't forget you were being careless. 
baby, you're careless. Man, I can hear, ooh, I'm going to cry talking about it. I can hear my grandpa's powerful voice. Davy, you're being careless. No, grandpa, I'm so sorry. But, but I was. I didn't care. It's David Newton. I'm on top of the world. Sometimes when we forget things, it's not innocent. It's actually because we don't care. We're careless. Our vision's off. It gets a little deep. I put some deeper things here. We for, we're forgetting to be patient sometimes. Is that just that I forgot? Oops, I forgot my cash. No, sometimes we just don't care to be patient. Uh, uh, we forget that people watch us on our social media account. It turns out, just in case you haven't heard me get off on this uh, in the last forever, come on, guys. Like, I know so many people I went to college with, people who are famous Christian people, and then they say just the meanest things online. And it's like, do you forget that when someone reads your angry, mean, rude Facebook post that they associate you with a Jesus, a church, a Christianity, a faith, and now all of a sudden you've made Jesus look like an arrogant jerk? Come on, stop doing that. Please think about when you, uh, your whole social media account, go back through it, look at your history this week. Is it communicating King Jesus and his kingdom? Or is it communicating something else? More on that later. We forget. I forget to love my wife sometimes. I love Nikki. Love her to death. Sometimes I forget. Is it because I, oh, oops, I forgot cash, forgot the tooth fairy? No. Sometimes I just don't care. Don't care enough. Uh, forget to pray. Forget to read scripture. Forget the Lord. Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot. Spiritual, spiritually in the Bible, forgetting is a big deal. Uh, there's times that people pray and say, God, remember not our sin. They're not asking God to, poof, forget. They're asking God to act in accordance to his love and kindness. Remember your love and kindness, Lord. They're asking him to remember something more deep, something that should run deeper in these things. Forget our sin. God, we don't believe you have the ability to just, poof, we can just ask you to forget things. No, we're pleading that maybe something deeper is happening here. There's some spiritual thing that we're moving towards. We want to forget and remember in a deep way. And so forgetting something in the world of the Bible is not, Ugh, I forgot my wallet. Can you pay for me, bro? It's not that. Forgetting is a deep spiritual thing. It's a choice. It's a decision to say, this isn't that important to me. The problem with the human heart is that it doesn't respond to laws. It responds to what it loves. And here with Israel, they didn't love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They decided to love themselves. They forgot God, and they decided to serve idols, which in turn was actually serving themselves. This is what we want, how we want things to be controlled. We're in control. It's our lives. We're going to do this the way we want to do this, Lord. And so they forget God. They knew it with their heads, but in their hearts, they weren't changed. They weren't following it. It wasn't real to them. Look, the Bible is a book of knowledge. I've said that here before. I'm not meaning to confuse or trample and say it's just a philosophical understanding. God, if God is true, if God created all things, he is the objective source, meaning the ultimate source, the core root of knowledge, existence of anything. And so the whole reason that fire is hot is because God created it to be objectively hot. God is the objective source of that hotness, right? Please quote me on that. God is the objective source of hotness. Don't put that online. God is the objective source of these things, right? One plus one is two. God created that. He's the objective source of that. We understand beautiful things because God is beautiful. We understand ugly things because God is beautiful. We understand good things because God is good. We understand sinful things because God is good. He's the objective source. And so the Bible is a book of knowledge. I've said this analogy before, but I think it's so important. Abraham, when he threw, or not Abraham, Moses, when he threw down his scepter, turned to the snake, and he trusted God, God didn't say, just have faith, brother faith. He said, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. You know me. I'm God. You know that I'm above you. That's your knowledge. And so that knowledge transformed him because he knew God. God isn't asking you to sit here and blindly twiddle in your navel and say, mm, I'm just going to have faith, man. Just trust it. God has given you knowledge. And he's saying, this is what's true. Look around you. Look at the things he's created. Look at the good things he's given you. Count your blessings. God is the objective source of every good thing in your life. And he's crying out for you to remember him. But then there's this pattern in scripture where we keep forgetting. The Bible is a book of knowledge. The Lord is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. All the, all the stories are true. All the stories are true. And we choose to forget them. We struggle. Second Peter helps us. Uh, Peter writes in Second Peter 1, 3 through 12. It's going to be on the screen. You can write it down. You can open it up in your Bible. Second Peter chapter 1. 
His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious uh, and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. There are sinful desires in the world. God has provided a way through his knowledge, through Jesus Christ, for us to escape that. There is corruption. It is corrupting you. You are dying. You are, you are falling into sin and death. God has provided a way apart from that from the sinful desires. For this reason, make every effort to supplement to your faith virtue and to virtue with knowledge and with knowledge, self-control and with self-control, steadfastness and with steadfastness, godliness and with godliness, with brotherly affection, with brotherly affection, love. Listen, we could talk all day about all those words. They're just, they're stuffs that God is doing in you through the spirit that should be raised up. That's fine, right? But he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these things should be growing in you. Verse 9, here's where it really hits. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that they are blind, having forgotten that they have been cleansed from their former sins. They've forgotten. If these things aren't growing in you, if you don't have this knowledge, if, if it's not growing into virtue and kindness and love, and these things, it's because you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from those things. In verse 12, Paul goes on to say, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Remind you. Appropriate knowledge leads to appropriate action. Write that down. Think about that. Because this is the key of everything. This is like a philosophical concept that I wish I could drill into everyone's head. The reason that you still struggle with sin is appropriate knowledge. The reason that you still drink alcohol time is appropriate knowledge. When you go to AA, when you go to any sort of counseling session, their whole fight for you is to have appropriate knowledge, to take the misguided, corrupt thoughts that you have and to guide them to appropriate knowledge. Now you unpack that and it begs the question, what is appropriate knowledge? The Lord. That is appropriate knowledge. And so now we have to say, well, what, what do we do with these things? We forget them. And, and Peter's telling us, I'm going to remind you. This is why we're here. This is why you hear me say the same things over and over. Like, okay, David's going to have his spiel now in Genesis 3. David's going to say his thing about being faithful to the teacher. David's going to say his thing about one body, one faith, and death. David's going to point this sign. He's going to say this. Because we forget. We have to be reminded. And Peter tells us, you're going to forget. And so I'm going to keep reminding you. And I echo what Peter says, man, the reason we teach the gospel every week, the reason we're going to remind you of Christ crucified and his death and resurrection and ascension every week is because we forget. We walk around like people who haven't been liberated by King Jesus. We walk around and live as people who don't have the power of the spirit in us that transforms us. And so every week we're going to talk about it. How do we remember? If these are true and we need to be reminded, how do we remember? How can we be reminded? How can we be reminded? There's three things. We talked about them a lot here. Prayer, scripture, and church. Man, drill those things in your mind. Measure your life by your relationship with prayer, scripture, and church. Prayer is intentional communication with the Lord, where you communicate to him and you listen for him to communicate to you. And that can happen in a lot of ways, right? You might, you might hear a word from your word, and you might have this cohesive idea that God puts in your mind, then you hear on the radio, then you read in scripture. But anytime you hear the Lord speak to you, it will always align with scripture, and it will always be affirmed by church people in your life, every single time. If you hear the Lord speak to you, and it's not affirmed in scripture, you say, hey, the Lord wants me to divorce my wife and move to Israel. I've, I've dealt with that. Talk to someone about that, right? Oh, I need to divorce my wife and move to Israel. That's what God's telling me to do. Nope. Not in scripture, it doesn't align, and I can't affirm that in the church, right? So if you think God's speaking to you right now, please look in scripture, ask church people. Say, hey, hey, this is why I feel like God's speaking to me, right? Because we need prayer, but we also need scripture. Scripture tells us what the, who the Lord is. This is appropriate knowledge. This is why uh, Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. John 6.63, 6, we talked about a few weeks ago, Jesus said, it is the spirit that brings life. The flesh is of no help. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Scripture, we need a relationship with Scripture in our life. Scripture tells us to observe the Lord's Supper and baptism. These two things remind us of who God is and, and what he's done, right? They remind us of Jesus' life, death, uh, resurrection, ascension. They remind us of our death to Christ and being raised to new life. That's why I make such a big deal about the Lord's Supper and baptism. And he told us to do these things. Why? Do this in remembrance of me. Where do we do those things? We do them in church. Prayer, scripture, and church. In church, 
We pray together as one. We understand, interpret, and wrestle with Scripture together. The parts that don't even make sense that we struggle with, we do it together. We pray together in the Spirit. It's Ephesians 6. We're unified. Uh, we pray in the Spirit as one, together, unified in Christ. We read Scripture together. We're one body in Christ. So Scripture goes so into this. Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, Galatians 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. It's all over. We are one body. You've heard me say a hundred times, one body, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, above all, through all. It's so important because you don't know what you don't know. You need the church. And man, I, I want to tell you, man, if you look around and you think of people that aren't here right now, and you think of people that, that you think should be here, you have friends who've gotten out of church, why aren't you making sure they're here? Do you believe this? Do you love them enough to let them know? Because I'm not talking about, hey, is Pastor David or Carrie keeping attendance on who's here and who's missed, you know, 42% of the weeks of this Sunday? I'm not talking about that attendance. I'm talking about how can you possibly remember what God is calling you to do if you're not here? I can tell you story after story after story. Man, you want to know a pretty common pattern that I notice in our church? Someone doesn't, they stop being here. They get convicted. They say, I feel like God is telling me to do this. And we talk to them. We surround them with discipleship. And as they start following God, they, get, they struggle with that. And they say, man, I don't know if I really want to commit to God. I, don't, I, don't, I want to control my own life. So then they get back into whatever it is, pills, alcohol, marijuana. That's a big one, by the way, marijuana. And then they decide, you know what? I don't want to be at church because I feel guilty and I don't want to have to tell people that I'm so struggling with this. And then they stop being here and then we don't hear from them again. And months go by and things get worse and worse and worse in their life. It's pretty consistent. And our argument is show up. Come here high if you need to. Be here because we love you and we're connected to King Jesus and we're doing this together. You don't know what you don't know. And I promise you, when you choose to not be here because of guilt and shame, or you choose to say, man, I don't need this anymore. I'm going to control this in my own way and do my own thing. It's not going to work out for you. Scripture is very clear on that. This is why we need each other. Say, we are one body in Christ. Say it like you believe it. I need you on this side to look across the room and find someone's eyes. You on this side, look at someone across the room, find their eyes and say, I need you and you need me in Christ. I need you. Say it again. I need you. This is so important because we are so programmed to sit in a seat like a theater, like a baseball game and sit and watch it and consume it as if it's just for me and this is my thing. And the whole reason we sing songs about we, us, and our, the whole reason we teach that worship is both vertical and horizontal, the whole reason we understand that together and we sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs together is because we're one body. And you need me and I need you. I don't need to throw the Bonhoeffer quote up here again because you guys have seen it a hundred times, but the Christ in my heart is weak and the Christ in your heart might be strong because you're not biased to my flesh. I need you. I need you to speak in my life. And we can't remember if we're not here. You need prayer, scripture, and church in your life. I can't drive that home enough. And if you're looking around right now and you're seeing empty seats, you're thinking, I wonder why that person's not here. I wonder where this person's at. Who's, who's reaching out to him? You should please. If you've got that person at work and you know that they, they've been hurt by the church and they don't want to connect, they don't even know Jesus, whose responsibility is it to let them know where truth comes from? What prevents them from being eternally separated from God? It's on you because you have that knowledge. God's given it to you. Please pray that the Spirit opens up your heart to these things because I'm so tired and it hurts so much to watch so many people fall away when we're here and we're saying we're here for you. We got to do it together, guys. It can't just be 10 of us who really, really, really care. It is a kingdom. It is one body, all of us. And we're going to keep teaching it because we're going to forget. I'm going to forget. I'm going to get selfish. I'm going to struggle. Do you have these postures in your life? Do you see prayer? Do you see scripture? Do you see connecting with the church? Are those things that are posture in your life? Judges 3, 7, and the people of Israel did what was evil inside the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. They forgot. Look at this. Mark 1, 15 was the first thing Jesus said when he started teaching. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Leave that up here for a minute. Repent and believe in the gospel. We've talked about this when we did the sermon. He said, what? When you think of Jesus, you think of? 
kingdom. Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. And he said, this is repent and believe in the gospel. To repent means to turn, to have a change, to rethink about the things you think about, to turn and go another way. It, it, it changes your mind, which therefore changes your action. That's what repent means. Belief is, is to, to put trust and hope into something, to say, I affirm this to be true. I have belief in it. We could talk philosophically about a justified true belief and knowledge, but in general, a belief to say, this is true. I'm committed to it, right? And then in the gospel, the gospel is the hope that the world is broken and is being made new through Jesus Christ, the Lord who loves you. And we can have all these different definitions of the gospel, but in general, this is my father's world and he's redeeming it all through Jesus Christ. He's making everything right. And so one day we'll live in a world without pain, without sadness. He'll wipe away every tear, without cancer. One day God's going to make it all right. And until that time, we continue to trust in the ways he is making it right. And we see his kingdom coming when people who, who decide, I'm going to flush all my drugs and start following Christ. Or I'm going to give up my self-hatred, uh, self-orbing ignorance. I'm going to start following Christ. People who say, man, I'm going to give up false religion and I'm going to seek King Jesus. We see moment by moment, step by step, he leads us. His kingdom come, his will be done. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is a cycle. This is why Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I had all these scriptures where, where the Bible goes hard on your mind being transformed. You get it. You get that appropriate knowledge is appropriate action. It's not a hard concept. You don't know what you don't know. And when you know those things, you're culpable for them. You're responsible for them. Jesus, Paul says, be transformed by the name of your mind. Look at, uh, I've got this kingdom cycle that I want you to see. Um, listen, raise your hand if you're like a graphic person. You've taken, and you, even, even in the 80s, you took a graphic class at one point. All of you are judging me and hate me right now. That's fine. I know what this looks like. I know you're thinking, David, why didn't you email me and have me make this? Stop, okay? Sometimes you just got to make something on Sunday mornings in PowerPoint, okay? This is as good as we get. Pay attention to what it looks like. Don't get distracted by the awful imaging. This is the kingdom cycle. Jesus said, the kingdom is at hand. What is happening in the kingdom? You have a constant pattern of repenting, believing in the gospel with Jesus Christ, the orbit. We've talked about this so many times, but we've got to remind ourselves because we forget Jesus is the core. He's the center. Measure everything in your life on is Jesus the center. Is Jesus the reason why I woke up this morning? Because God's mercies are new every day, and he sustains your life. So if you woke up this morning, agree with him that he decided that you should be alive and trust him with your life. Is Jesus the center of your job, your parenting, you mowing your yard, whatever it is, is Jesus at the center of it? And, and the reason this cycle is so important is because when we see the kingdom, it's a group. We're doing it together. We need to repent and believe in the gospel. And there are some things in our life that don't fall into this. There are some things in your life, if you're like me, that you struggle with this. You say, man, I, I need to have a change of mind. God needs to repent me of, of some of the ways that I approach parenting sometimes. And I need to grow in my repentance and my belief in the gospel. It's not one moment where God said, boop, now everything's good. He's just looking up there and he's like, and I'm going to say this one and this one and this one. It's not how it works, right? God calls us. And we respond, and we could talk all the days of Calvinism, how it works. I, I don't know. God calls us, we respond, praise God, that now we are his. And as he does that, he has a continual cycle where he is transforming our minds. He is drawing us in repentance through his spirit into his image. And the Bible tells us, Ephesians 4, that that's being done as one body. We're doing this together. We are interwoven as his body, every ligament being strengthened together in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. So we have this cycle. Is this a pattern in your life? Is Jesus the sinner? In the judges' cycle, you see that they end up in this situation where they have a deliver, and then they have peace, and then something happens in between here. This little black space, right, right here. Ugh, fitness, look out, up there. That little black space between peace and sin, something happens to cause that. Why don't they keep being in peace? Why don't they keep what leads them to sin? They forget. James 1, 14 and 15 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. A lot of times, instead of the kingdom cycle where we're seeing the whole world as the kingdom and King Jesus, a lot of times we have a cycle that looks like this where we put ourselves in the middle. This cycle, this self-orbiting cycle kind of starts looking like this. Me, I'm in the center. I'm stinking David Newton. 
It's all about me. It's my orbit. It's my world. Y'all just living in it. Welcome, right? So we put ourselves in the center. And that starts with we start having temptation. As uh, James is telling us, and then we forget. We have these temptations. We forget that Christ is at the center, that he's the orbit. It starts becoming all about us. And that leads us to idols, to doubting, to selfish desires. You can find all sorts of verses and all sorts of patterns. It's hard to even put enough words there because it all connects. These are idols. These are things we control, that we put power to, that we think that these things are, are going to be in control. But they actually control us because they all lead to sin and death. And the Bible is very concerned with this cycle that when we're at the center, we corrupt and break things. And it's so important that we say we, because so often we want to make this personal now. It's just about me. The whole world is corrupt because of you and everyone in this room, including myself. We've all corrupted it. Our sin has broken all of these things. But then most personally, you need to be asking, where is this cycle in my life, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my algebra class, at Blair Oaks, Capital City, at J.C.? Where, 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 am I fitting, where am I putting myself at the center and saying, man, I'm constantly having these temptations and forgetting who God is, and that leads me to doubting, to indulging my selfish desires. And ultimately, the Bible says that's just going to lead to sin and death. And you see this cycle over and over. Like, how do I get out of this? It's because we're forgetting. We're forgetting the truth. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is now. Repent and believe in the gospel. The time is fulfilled, Mark 1.15. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. How do we put Christ at the center? How do we keep him as the, as the center orbit? Through prayer, scripture, and church. We need to remember. We need to not forget. See how these things connect. Judges 3, and the people of Israel did what was evil inside the Lord. They forgot the Lord and they served idols. We talked about idols a lot last week. I'm going to throw up the definition again real quick, what weight is, because he's a faster clicker than I am. But uh, Tim Keller had this definition we looked at. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Let that sink in. Anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. Anything can become an idol. I heard a guy preaching once and he said, tell me all about your ministry and I'll tell you about your idol. Tell me all about your family that God gave you and I'll tell you about your potential idol. Tell me all about your budget and how God has given you a debt-free budget. And I'll tell you about a potential idol. Anything in our life that we give important to, that we give value. It can even be something God gave us. God gave them peace. God gave them deliverance. And they still corrupted it, made it about themselves. They put themselves in the center. Do you see that that's the temptation? That's what evil's been telling us all along. In Genesis 3, you can be like God. You can know good from evil. It can be all about you. Anything that we give power, attention, passion to other than the God, this is an idol. When we focus on our idols, we put ourselves in control. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, I hadn't thought about this until this week, but, you, you know, idol is such a churchy Christian word. And I wish that there was, you know, a word that, like, we could all connect to, but I think we just have to constantly define it. Because then when we say idol, some of us are so clear, like, well, I don't have idols in my life because I don't have a little statue of someone in my... In general, when we're giving something more value than God, we're giving something more orbit, more control, that's an idol in our life. And I think a lot of us, even if we don't want to admit we have these idols, we can see the potential idols in our life. Some of them are sitting right next to you. Nikki is a wonderful wife. She's a terrible God. And sometimes I want her to be my savior. I want her to be my God. My children are awesome. They're terrible gods. Some of you are really great friends. You're terrible gods. And I can't impose on you something that only God can do. This church is an amazing church. It's a terrible God. Our church can't replace your relationship with God. We can connect you to it. We can be a part of it. We're all in it together, but we are not the head. Jesus Christ is the head. And so if you're not surrendering to that, all these things just become idols. They become things you do. They become duties. They become things that make you in control of your life. All of idol connectedness is an exchange. It says, I'm going to do X for you, so you do Y for me. And many of us, that's our Christianity. God, if I read my Bible enough, you should bless me. If I pray enough, then you shall do this in my life. If I attend enough church services, then this should be the right thing. And then we're baffled when things don't go well in our life. Scripture tells us, something very fascinating about our righteous work. See, God, God demands a surrender of our heart. He doesn't want a negotiation from you because you have nothing to offer God. I have nothing to offer God. Isaiah 46, 6, 
We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. Some of you grew up with the filthy rags translation, same thing. We all fade like a leaf, and our sin, our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Matthew 6.3, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The reason they're blessed, we talked about this so much, this open hand posture, because they recognize they don't have anything in their bank account. There's no bargaining with God. You don't say, I did this, so you do this. We don't have anything. Before a righteous, a holy, a perfect God, we all fall short. We've all sinned. The best we've done are like filthy rags, polluted rags, messed up garments. We've got nothing to offer him. And so in this cycle sometimes when we're putting ourselves in the middle, it still becomes about us. We say, hey, our idol becomes church or service. It all falls apart. It still leads to sin and death because it's about you. I urge you to think about who's at the center of your orbit. Are you forgetting God? Are you serving idols? Because I do. And I struggle with that. And I wanted to wrestle and share that with you today. I want to read the rest of the story so we hear a little bit of Othniel. And then we'll, uh, we'll close out. Judges chapter 3, verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals, Baals and the Asherah. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, they cried out to the Lord. They repented. They turned to the Lord. They remembered the Lord. When they cried out to him, what did he do? The Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who had saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Uh, he's by far the best person so far in Judges. Uh, we could talk a lot about that, but basically he's going to be the best judge you get. They all get terrible after this. Uh, we know little about him, but the stuff we do know, he's a good guy. The spirit, Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. So God didn't just raise him up. The spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he judged Israel. He led them, he, he took care of them, he protected them, all those words are company and judge. He went out to war, and the land, uh, and the Lord gave Cushan, Rashathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands, and his hand prevailed over Cushan, Rishathathiam. Man, that's just not a word I expect to say four or five times today. Anyway, he prevailed over Cushan. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kinez, died. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil on the side of the Lord. See this cycle. The people cried out to the Lord. They repented. Repent and believe the gospel. And God provided a deliverer for them. The Lord's deliverer, Othniel, what does it say? One fact about him. What happened? He was filled, or the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. We've talked a lot about Ruach. Say Ruach. ruach. You got, ugh. Yeah, some of you just went, ugh. You know where I'm going with this. Ruach, it's breath. It's animating life force. When the spirit hovered over the waters, when it said, Lord, remove not your spirit from me. Ruach is the Old Testament word for spirit, and it means animating life force. It means this power that makes things exist that only connects to God. It's this uh, ethereal thing. Jesus uses a similar word in Greek, uh, pneuma, to describe it. And when he says to uh, uh, Nicodemus, he said, ah, oh, the spirit comes and goes where it wills, right? There's this whole idea about the spirit of God in scripture that we don't fully understand it. And please catch that. You don't understand the spirit because it's God. It's not for you to understand. We submit to it. We have a relationship with the Lord and we receive his spirit, right? But it's not something we control. It's not something we understand. And so it makes sense that sometimes scripture is this thing where the spirit falls on us and these intense things happen. And sometimes people speak in tongues where it's uh, actual languages that other people hear. And sometimes they speak in tongues and it's, it's angelic babbles that people don't understand. And then sometimes they heal people. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it leads to tons of baptism. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the spirit has all these huge movements and then sometimes it is a huge war that the Spirit leads a deliverer to do. It's all these different things. And we could talk all day long about how those things work out, but what we need to understand is that it's not perfectly prescriptive. It's descriptive. It reminds us this is what the Spirit can do and what it does. And it doesn't mean that if we pray, God's going to tell us all to go out and fight some big holy war because that's what the Spirit always does. No, it's not what the Spirit always does. Sometimes the Spirit leads people to not do things. And so it's important. But the Spirit fell on Othniel, and I think it's so important we see that this animating force fell on him. And other times when we hear the Holy Spirit talked about, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in him you also, in Jesus, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed 
with the promised Holy Spirit. When you believed in him, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is our guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. When you believe, the Spirit enters you. Jesus said, we'll make our home in you. Spirit enters. Throw up that image of the, the kingdom cycle, right? With Jesus at the center. Jesus is at the center. And here's what's so interesting about this. Jesus isn't at the center where we're just trying to constantly, okay, through my belief, I'm going to get to Jesus. Through my repentance, I'm going to get to Jesus. Through the gospel, I'm going to Jesus goes to you right now. Jesus is going to you with his gospel. He's saying, here is my spirit. I'm offering it to you. And if you would believe, I will enter you. I'll make my home in you. And you'll be sealed in an internal inheritance with me. And when the father looks at you, he doesn't see the sin and all the times that you struggle with your wife or you struggle with your husband or you struggle with your kids or you struggle at school or all the times you look at porn, all the times you drink. All the time. That's not what Jesus sees anymore. What Jesus sees is himself dying for you. The Lord sees that Jesus paid for your sin because his spirit enters you and he seals you in him. And then he transforms you. This is the gospel. This is what it means to repent believe in the gospel. This is why this cycle matters because all of a sudden your mind is transformed and you can't not think of the world this way. You can't not think of how do I approach my job is as King Jesus would. How do I approach my, my family, my friends as King Jesus would? Because the spirit is in us. When Jesus defines the Spirit in John 14, 26, he says two very helpful things. He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he'll bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. I think it's interesting that Israel forgot God. And God sends them a deliverer. And that deliverer has the Spirit of God fall on them. And that deliverer reminds them that God is in control, that God delivers them, that God is all-powerful. And later on, when Jesus talks about the Spirit, he says, the Spirit will remind you of everything I've taught you, of truth, of reality. Are these postures in your life? Do you see the Spirit reminding you of things? The Spirit helps us remember. It convicts us. It leads us to know Jesus better. It leads us on this cycle of Jesus being the orbit to repent and believe. This is why as Christians, we can say two things for sure. If you're a Christian, these two things we're about to throw up are definitely true of you. And man, don't hear legalism right now. This is just scripture, right? This is, this is what we see in scripture. Two things happen. You have progressive increase in the fruit of the Spirit. This comes from Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Some of you are singing a song in your head right now. The fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. Right, right. But it is these things, right? Progressive increase the fruit of the Spirit. You see these things coming out of you. Because you're constantly repenting and believing in the gospel, you say, you know what? I'm not going to approach social media this way because it doesn't lead me to be kind. I'm not going to approach my family this way because it doesn't lead me to be patient. I'm not going to have this hobby, have this much control over my time because it's not leading me to gentleness or self-control. You also have progressive victory over sin. You're being transformed in Christ away from the sin and death and selfishness cycle. You see your idols falling apart. You hold them accountable to Jesus. You're constantly putting Jesus at the center. It doesn't mean you're, you're not sinning. You're perfect. You're growing that way. You're being sanctified is the word the Bible uses. Are you seeing these things in your life? The fruit of the Spirit, progressive victory over sin. Are you tra trajecting in the Spirit of the Lord who sealed you? In the end, it says, the land had rest for 40 years. Othniel, the son of Kenez, died, and the people again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They had peace, they had freedom for 40 years, and then Othniel died. He couldn't ultimately deliver them because he died. He died, and the deliverance came and went. The story tells us that we need a Savior who's alive. Jesus is alive. Othniel died, every human leader will die. I'm going to die. Those of you who are just here because you're going to hear David tell you about something, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm actually going to, before that, I'm going to screw up and let you down. You just wait. I'll do something real bad. It'll happen. Because we all make mistakes. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all going to die. Ultimately, we all die with sin. We all have these things in us. But as the Spirit enters us, we're sealed eternally. We're transformed. And then we hold on to Jesus. And Jesus is alive. Revelation 1.18, Jesus says, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the, and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. This is your hope. This is it. We read earlier how all of our righteousness is like polluted rags, how we all struggle. Listen, man, this is where it comes down. It comes down to you. 
We've, we've hit on a lot of things right now, just in one verse, in the whole forgetting and having idols. And we could talk forever about it, but it is a pattern so prevalent in my life, in your life. It's all through scripture that I couldn't help but say, we're going to emphasize this. And David Newton's not doing it for you. Carrie Sullivan's not doing it for you. Oath Neil didn't do it for them. Only Jesus can bring peace. Only Jesus can bring deliverance. Only Jesus can bring freedom from your idols. And so I want to put it on you. You know, when, when Peter preached a sermon in, in Acts 2, they said, that says the people were cut to heart. And they said, what do we do? I want to read Peter's words to you. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we move into a time of response, my prayer for you, my hope, is that you're seeing yourself on one of these cycles. You say, man, I am at the center, and I see this constant pattern of doubt, of forgetting, of following after idols, of sin and death. Maybe you say, I don't see a progressive victory over sin in my life. I don't see the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Maybe I don't have the Holy Spirit in me. Maybe I haven't repented and been baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Maybe I don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Please, don't find offense in that. I've been in church 3,000 times. Stop, forget, I don't care what you've done. You're righteous, filthy rags. Jesus says, be poor in spirit. I don't, I don't care how great you are. Only thing that matters right now is repenting and believing the gospel. That's it. That's what you have. So when we move into a time response right now, the band's going to come up. They're going to play. Sorry, I'm supposed to walk down here. That's their cue. There we go. As we move into a time response, this is so important. Don't get distracted by the, the steps of church and how these things happen. Do you have a posture of repenting and believing in the gospel? Or are you on the posture that says, I'm forgetting. I'm constantly forgetting. I need to remember. I'm constantly seeking after idols. I need to remember. And the way you grow in that is prayer, scripture, and church. We want to help you. You say, I don't know how to read the Bible. Come talk to us. Let's figure that out together. Sometimes I don't know how to read the Bible. I'm learning how to read Judges. Let's do it together, right? I don't know how to pray. Uh, I feel like I'm talking to the ceiling. Let's talk about it. We do this together. Do you have a healthy posture of church in your life? Who's not here? Why are you not here sometimes? We need each other. You need me and I need you in Christ. And so look at these cycles. Look at these things. Progressive victory over sin. Progressive increase of the fruit of the Spirit. May these things convict us in the power of His Spirit. And may it lead us to this posture of opening our hands and saying, I'm going to repent and believe in the gospel. And maybe today's your first time. You say, I really need to give my life to Christ. Let's come talk about it. Maybe you need to join the church. Let's come talk about it. As we worship, as we sing right now, open your hands. Be poor in spirit. Repent and believe the gospel. God, I pray that your spirit would move and that you would help us not forget, that you would help us remember. You tell us that your spirit is going to teach us all things and remind us of the things Christ taught us. And I pray that your spirit would remind us, those of us who've forgotten, those of us who, who, who get into this, idols and doubt, the selfish cycle, all these things, God, we want to open up to you right now. May you be real to us in our heads and in our hearts. May we be transformed by new of our minds. Beyond all these words that we've said, God, we pray that we would repent and believe in the gospel through you, through your spirit. Guide us as we respond right now.